After seeing the developments over the past week regarding the war in Ukraine and of course the massive potential Russian escalation, I almost immediately jumped on this channel as that was happening and made a video. But instead, I decided to sit back and think this through and try to listen to as many different voices as possible. And now I think is the time to come on here and present what I think are the most important headlines to have come out of this entire mess, which I think is probably the only word you can really use to describe this, and try to think through what is actually going to happen next. Is Putin in trouble within Russia? Is nuclear war on the horizon? What will happen to the international political situation over the next few months? Let's take a look and try to find out. I'm Stuart Hooper, a lecturer in political science and PhD researcher. Be sure to subscribe if you are new here to the channel where I look at international politics from a critical angle. I'm not concerned with supporting any mainstream political parties or political figures. And in actual fact, I think a lot of those things have really gotten us into the disastrous situation that the world currently finds itself in. We need to be concerned with the real power structures in the world, how they interact with one another, and how they may eventually collapse, which is really the focus of this video. Be sure to subscribe if you are new here, share this video everywhere you can, and you can follow me on other social media platforms at the links below. And thanks to all of you new subscribers here. I'm now well on the road to 4,000 subs. Would love to get there in a couple of months' time. So, of course, what are we talking about today? We're talking about what Putin has done this past week. And that's two major things. The first, of course, Putin raises the specter of nuclear weapons following battlefield losses. And the major quote, which I'm sure you've all heard by this point, if the territorial integrity of our country is threatened, we will without a doubt use all available means to protect Russia and our people. This is not a bluff. And the other major aspect of this announcement was, of course, the mobilization of around 300,000 reservists in the Russian military. However, as we see in this headline, there's something else going on here that may mean the number of people that end up being called up into this conflict could actually be far higher and may actually be at 1 million Russians that may be brought into this conflict. And this was a Russian newspaper that examined precisely what was going on here in a little bit more detail. So the numbers are massive, the consequences also massive. A brief note on that group of people that are being called up here, and then we're going to delve into the nuclear question on a lot of different levels because I think that is the most important for our focus in this video right now and in current global affairs. Who are these people that are being called up? Where do they come from? What are their backgrounds? All of this sort of stuff. The very fact that this is a group of reservists suggests just in that very fact that this is not going to be the most highly qualified, highly trained group of soldiers that the world has ever seen. Yes, it's a very large number, and if it does tick all the way up to a million, that is, of course, an even larger number, what real threat do they actually present on the battlefield right now is the question that will have to be asked. And I'm not sure that it's the massive threat that Putin thinks it may be. I think instead of throwing more and more bodies into what is ultimately becoming a meat grinder, a war of attrition, I think what they actually really need are better technological capabilities, something to fight back against all of the weapons that the West has been funneling into Ukraine. But of course, the Russians cannot get those right now because of the sanctions that the country is under preventing the transfer of any sort of technology that would assist in the continuation of this 
conflict. Therefore, that brings us to our nuclear question, right? If that's all true, these are reservists, they're not really going to cause a massive impact on the uh, realities on the battlefield because of this. They're not the most highly trained, they don't have the best technologies or comparable technologies to what is being funneled in by the West right now. And it is just going to be a meat grinder and it ends up going terribly. Does this raise the specter of let's press the big red button and let's launch some tactical nuclear weapons or even strategic large-scale nuclear weapons into this situation? That is, of course, where we are left with this discussion. Now, I think there are four possible options when it comes to the nuclear question for Putin. Um actually five one that i mentioned in in the um the prior video looking at the collapse of russian forces a couple of days ago so let's go through each of these the first would be to not go nuclear this is clearly what putin is right now trying to do he's trying to maintain a conventional approach to this conflict but as i've just alluded to at what point do you say the conventional approach is clearly failing, no matter how many people we throw into this, and then switch to a nuclear approach? That's potentially where we are. Or, at what point do you maintain the conventional approach and see it failing, and then decide to retreat, to fall back, to not escalate to the nuclear level? That is where we want to stay. We do not want to go into the nuclear realm, but of course there are options here. What are those options? Putin could launch a nuclear test within Russia. Now, this wouldn't be a large-scale test like you can go and find the old videos of back in the day from the uh, 50s, where you have a massive explosion in some piece of deserted land somewhere in Russia. It wouldn't be anything like that. It would probably be an underground nuclear test, which is how these things have been done for many, many, many decades. Um, primarily thanks to non-proliferation treaties, potential damage to the environment that nuclear tests cause, of course. But what would this say? That would confirm, perhaps that Putin is indeed not bluffing, that he is willing to go nuclear by sending this really large signal to the Western world. Look, we do have these things, and they work, they're operational, and we're testing them. Don't test us in terms of where the next one is going to land, right? It won't be underground, it will be on... Ukraine. It will be on Berlin. It will be on Paris. That's an option. Aside from that, what else do we have? Well, Putin could launch a tactical weapon within Ukraine. A small-scale nuclear device. These exist. They have never been used in a combat situation but they do exist. So when we think of nuclear deployment, nuclear weapons, nuclear war, we tend to think end of the world, massive explosions, entire cities erased off of the map. We'll get to that point in a second, but with the tactical nuclear weapons, that's not what these things are designed to do. These are low-yield devices that are trying to destroy and really guarantee the destruction of a particular target in a particular place. Now, there are a number of options that Putin has here in terms of a tactical usage of a nuclear weapon. Um, something in perhaps a less densely populated area of Ukraine um, as a show of force, something perhaps against a enlarged military target within Ukraine could also be the target of one of these tactical weapons 
Or, of course, you could go ahead and launch it at a minor city, um, a minor civilian target, not a Kiev level city, um, but something smaller than that. This whole approach, what would this do? Well, ultimately, the intent would be to strike fear into the heart of Ukraine and into perhaps even more so than the Ukrainians themselves, into the Western world, which is supplying all of the support for the Ukrainian military right now. So these are the options. And like I said, we've got a couple more here as well. Putin could strike at a NATO target. I think this is the least likely because, of course, that practically guarantees nuclear war. And if Putin is approaching this through the lens of we're trying to make Russia great again, while well, getting into a thermonuclear war with NATO certainly guarantees the complete opposite of that. But it is an option, and of course it's on the table. The other final point that could happen here with these nuclear weapons, the fifth option, is that Putin decides to pick up the phone order a nuclear strike of a strategic, large-scale, or tactical, small-scale level, either one, and the commander on the other end of the line says, no, we're not doing that, hangs up the phone, and then we see some shifts within Russia. This is also possible. Let's take a look at a couple more headlines, because in terms of where we shift... This is absolutely not set in stone, and there are options here as well. So strap in, everyone. We've got a lot more um, to look at here in terms of properly evaluating this situation. Two real options. Serbian president warns of looming threats of global conflict like World War II. And here the Serbian president this past week said... I assume that from the phase of a special military option, we are approaching a major war. And now the question is, where are the borders and whether we will go after some time, maybe a month or two, into a major world conflict, the likes of which we haven't had since World War II. So that's option number one. This is option number two, which of course we're not going to uh, pay to access in any further detail. Putin is in trouble. Interesting. So these are our two big options, of course, with some nuances and variations um, within each of them. The global conflict point, I think I've covered enough so far to this point in this video. So let's think in a little more detail about this other headline. Putin is in trouble. Is this true? If it is, or if it isn't, we again get different potential avenues that we might head down. Let's assume that it is true. If Putin is in trouble and is ousted by some palace coup, a force within the Kremlin decides to oust him in one way or another, whether that be with his blood being spilled or with him packed onto a private jet and sent halfway around the world somewhere. But he's gone. Well, what does that actually mean for the international political situation? You, your immediate reaction might be, well, that's fantastic, right? Putin's gone. The key arbiter of the invasion of Ukraine has gone away into the sunset or into the grave, but he's gone. Fantastic. Surely the war will now end. Well, maybe. And that's, of course, what you would hope for. But that is by no means guaranteed. What if the faction that does this within Russia is of the ultra-nationalist variety? The people that think Putin has not gone far enough in Ukraine. These people exist as well. They exist within the Russian political sphere, within Russian media commentary that you can find online. There are people that think Putin should have already unleashed the nuclear warheads, should have already attacked NATO countries, should have already mobilized the entire country and started World War III to, of course, 
restore the greatness of Russia. If you kick Putin out, if he's gone, you may get something else that is potentially far worse. This is just worth keeping in mind. But within Russia, there are some things occurring which could suggest that maybe he's in trouble, but perhaps not to the degree of losing a grip on power. And again, I'm sure by now all of you have seen these sorts of headlines. Russians rush for flights out amid partial reservist call-up. And how to break an arm becomes top Google trend as Russians face conscription. What is hard to measure from these moves is precisely how many people are thinking this way and moving in this direction versus how many people actually support Putin and what he's doing. A couple of things to keep in mind here. Remember what this is within Russia. This is not a war. This is not an invasion. This is not offensive. This is a special military operation. Um, similar language to what the Western world has used throughout the so-called war on terror of the past two decades. Oh, if all of that didn't exist, what a different moral position the Western world would be in right now. That's a topic for another day. These headlines, however, do suggest something. They suggest that there is at least a degree of of measurable resistance to Putin within Russia. This is important because people think if you're a dictator, you don't need popular support. You don't need people to support your rule. This couldn't be any further from the truth. All you need to read to understand this is Machiavelli's The Prince. There's one quote in there which says something along the lines of, it's far better for the people to love you than despise you because then what you decide to do as the autocratic leader is more readily accepted. Why do autocracies exist anywhere in the world? Why does a place like Saudi Arabia exist? How do these monarchs exist? Well, because they provide a set of benefits to their citizens to keep them quiet to keep them in their place within society so they don't rise up and overthrow them. In the Middle Eastern case, of course, that's oil revenues, which the state can use to then provide masses of benefits to its citizens. So they all kind of just sit down and hush up. They don't make a political stir because they're actually getting quite a lot from this political system. Yes, it's autocratic, but it's providing them with benefits. Putin appears to be crossing the line of moving away from that structure, of being able to offer benefits to the Russian people, and edging into the realm of just becoming an autocrat. What does this mean? Resistance will rise, it will become stronger, and it will be harder for him to maintain control. If you had a million Russians in the street tomorrow protesting all of this, you'd probably likely see change very quickly, which brings us back to a phrase that I've used on this channel over and over again. Get active or get radioactive. And the activity that we need to see now are Russian people on the streets to a degree that is this times 100. You need to show opposition to Putin and you need to do it right now before we do end up down this nuclear escalatory spiral, which we are all trying to avoid. India, a nation that was not initially willing to condemn Putin's move in Ukraine as a rising power itself, looking to perhaps look for options outside of the Western-led international order, well now has shifted its tone rather dramatically on what Putin has done in Ukraine. And the Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, saying, 
I know that today's era is not an era of war, and I have spoken to you on the phone about this. And also the Chinese have offered a similar rebuke of Putin. Uh, it's kind of an underhanded rebuke over the past week. But the Chinese are also saying that they need to, quote, focus on preparing for wars. While behind the scenes, at least, the US has privately warned Russia against using nuclear weapons in Ukraine for several months. The waning international support for Putin's war in Ukraine, specifically India and China, who were perhaps at the outset of this, hoping that maybe he would be successful and this would create a new international power block that could oppose the Western world, well, they're, they're now seeing the failure of the initial Russian invasion and starting to question this whole thing. What does that mean? Well, it means that if tomorrow morning Putin wakes up and does decide to use a tactical nuclear strike on Ukraine, that he may all of a sudden have some very angry phone calls from the Indians and from the Chinese. Because that would be a truly unprecedented development in international politics and in global conflict. you got to remember, there has not been a nuclear detonation of any kind on a battlefield since World War II. And during World War II, the United States, who launched those weapons, the US was the only country in the world that had them. So it was a very different situation. It wasn't like all of a sudden, the very next day, that um, the US might find nukes coming in its direction. That's not true at all. Now we're in a completely different world. If Russia starts to launch nuclear weapons, the Indians and the Chinese are going to look at this and say, do you realize the escalatory spiral that you've probably just started? We can no longer support this on any level. This is called the nuclear taboo, and it is extremely powerful. Um, don't think that ideas don't have power in the international system. They have immense power. And the idea that using nuclear weapons is a line that should never be crossed is an immensely powerful idea. Just take a look at the Cold War. Decades of conflict. Not a single nuclear device detonated on a battlefield. We need to keep things that way. And on that last headline, the US privately talking to Russia for months on this particular question, that's useful because that says two things. It says, well, not only is the US reinforcing the nuclear taboo, but there is an open channel of communication between the Americans and the Russians. That's great because how did we resolve the Cuban Missile Crisis? with open channels of communication behind the scenes. Secret channels of communication, but communication nonetheless. It is possible to talk our way out of this problem. How precisely do we do that? Well, we have to be nuanced, we have to be thoughtful, and we have to ultimately not jump to extremes. Reaching a compromise, reaching a deal... This is something that we should be aiming at. An all or nothing approach to this isn't going to bring us back from the brink. We need to leave open doors to Putin to escape the situation relatively unharmed and not feel like he has to escalate to the nuclear level. If you shut off all the options, what are you left with? The classic cornered rat scenario. Not good when the cornered rat has nuclear weapons. And how was the Cuban Missile Crisis resolved? With a deal with the Western world giving something up and the Eastern world, the Soviet bloc, giving something up. Those Jupiter missiles in Turkey that were removed by the United States months after the crisis. That was a result of a deal, a compromise that was struck between the two sides. Yes, 
I get the Ukrainians want to fight. No, they should never have been invaded. Yes, they should try and get their territory back to the way that it was prior to this invasion. That doesn't mean that a compromise, that a deal should be entirely off the table. They should be doing both things simultaneously. Fighting back and trying to escape the situation as relatively unharmed as they can at this point, which of course is tough at this point because of where we are after months on end of fighting. Um, but this is what we should be doing. That These channels of communication, we need to head down this road, start talking and get ourselves out of this sooner rather than later, everyone. So this is my overview of everything that's happened here in the past week. Remember to subscribe, especially if you are a new viewer and have made it all the way to the end of this video. I really appreciate that. Follow me on the social media platforms below and um, we'll continue to keep an eye on this situation um, because there is so much going on here. There's probably going to be more uh, videos on this channel that tend to be longer and longer as it takes longer and longer to think this stuff through. Um, and just as one final point, I'd advise all of you to listen to as many different voices on this as possible. I've been listening to Russians, to Ukrainians, to leaders of NATO. You need to listen more than you speak. And while this YouTube channel is, of course, about me speaking... I spend far more time listening to others talk than I do talk myself. Um, this is a, a good general rule of thumb, I think, for approaching situations that are this complex and this potentially dangerous. Um, so keep that in mind. See what you guys can, can figure out about this and, and leave me anything in the comments that I didn't mention or you think I glossed over or missed in my analysis. Any other headlines that you guys have seen because it would really help to generate not only a useful conversation, but perhaps to help think through some solutions. And one final point on the get, get active or get radioactive thing. I said now that really applies to Russians and it does, but it also applies to us too. We should be calling our congressmen, calling our members of parliament and saying to them, yes, we understand that you want to help Ukraine fight and defend itself, but we also do not want to die in a nuclear war. We need compromise, we need you to talk to the other side, and we need a solution to this now. Thanks again for everyone watching and making it all the way to the end here, and I'll be back with another video in a couple of days on the economic crisis, which of course, everything that's going on here that I've just spoken about is only adding to and making even worse. So I'll be back with that video in a couple of days. Thank you all for watching and I'll be back soon.